Hello everyone, and welcome back to another video of Total Organic Chemistry. This video, I'm going to be taking a look at leaving groups and nucleophilicity in SN2 reactions. So by the end of this video, the questions that you should be able to answer are what affects leaving group ability in SN2 reactions? What are some common leaving groups that we use in organic synthesis? And what affects the strength of a nucleophile in an SN2 reaction? And if you need a little bit of review or an introduction to SN2 reactions in general, please feel free to subscribe to my channel and take a look at some of my previous videos on those topics. So let's start with leaving group ability. The most useful thing to keep in mind for this is that the weaker the base, the better the leaving group. So if we take a look at the halogens here, we can write F minus, Cl minus, Br minus, and I minus, and those could all hypothetically be leaving groups in SN2 reactions. And we know that going down the periodic table, the biggest halogens have the strongest conjugate acids. So for example, HI, hydroiodic acid, is by far the strongest acid of the halogen acids, whereas HF, hydrofluoric acid, is the weakest acid. So what that means is that I minus is the weakest base, so it's kind of the opposite, whereas F minus is the strongest base of the halogens. So what we can say is that as we move down the halogens, we get weaker bases, which means that we get better leaving groups. So for example, we could take a look at two different SN2 reactions with derivatives of ethane. So we could look at fluoroethane, treating it with a nucleophile, NaOH, so our nucleophile is going to be OH minus, and forming ethanol, so substituting that fluorine with an OH group. We can also take the same nucleophile and react it with iodoethane, so just changing the halogen substituent, and getting the same product. And if we compare the rates of these two reactions, we find out that the second reaction with iodine as the leaving group is much faster. And that tells us that iodine is a better leaving group than fluorine because it is a weaker base, and because of that weak basicity, it is much more willing to come off and exist in solution as I minus. Whereas F minus is not as willing to exist by itself in solution and therefore forms a much stronger bond with the carbon in fluoroethane. Up until now, we've been using halogens exclusively as leaving groups, but halogens are not the only thing that can be leaving groups in substitution reactions. So for example, we could take a look at maybe some derivatives of sulfuric acid that are commonly used as leaving groups in organic synthesis. So one of these sulfuric acid derivatives is trifluoromethane sulfonic acid. So you take sulfuric acid, and substitute one of those OH groups with a trifluoromethyl substituent. And because that's a mouthful, we usually just refer to it as triflic acid. And it has a pKa of about minus 15, which is incredibly low. So an incredibly strong acid, which means that the conjugate base, with this O- instead of OH, is very, very weak, which makes it a very good leaving group. Another derivative of sulfuric acid that is commonly used is p-toluene sulfonic acid, where instead of that trifluoromethane substituent, we have a toluene substituent on the sulfur. And again, we like to shorten the name to just tosylic acid or even tosic acid. The pKa of this is close to that of sulfuric acid, right around minus 3, which makes it not as strong of an acid as triflic acid, but still quite strong. So it is also a very good leaving group in SN2 reactions. We could also even use water as a leaving group, so H2O. And remember, we're looking for weak bases, so we take a look at the conjugate acid, and the conjugate acid of H2O is hydronium ion, H3O+, and the pKa of H3O+, is about minus 2. So that is also a strong acid which means that H2O is going to be a pretty weak base, and therefore a decent leaving group. 
I also want to talk a little bit about nucleophilicity, so the strength of nucleophiles in SN2 reactions, and how you can determine that. And there are three main properties that we can compare. So the first of those properties is charge. So if you take a look at related nucleophiles with the same sort of central atom, the more negative charge you have on that central atom, the stronger your nucleophile will be. So we can look at OH minus, so we have a minus charge on the oxygen, H2O, so a neutral charge on the oxygen, and H3O plus, a positive charge. And like I said, the more negative charge, the stronger your nucleophile will be. So OH minus is a pretty strong nucleophile. H2O can also act as a nucleophile, but we would usually consider it a weak nucleophile. Whereas H3O plus is basically non-nucleophilic. It doesn't usually act as a nucleophile at all. We can also look at derivatives of ammonia. So we can have NH2 minus, the amide anion. NH3, so neutral nitrogen, and NH4 plus ammonium cation. And just like we have above, NH2 minus will be our strong nucleophile. It's actually a very strong nucleophile. NH3 is also a pretty good nucleophile. And NH4 plus is, again, non-nucleophilic. The second property is basicity. So stronger bases make for better nucleophiles in general. So if we look at atoms from the same period of the periodic table, we can look at maybe NH2 minus, OH minus, and F minus. So all from the second period right next to each other on the periodic table. We can compare their basicities pretty easily. So we know that NH2 minus is the strongest base of these three because NH3, its conjugate acid, is the weakest conjugate acid. Whereas OH- minus is in the middle, it's a slightly weaker base than NH2-, minus, and F- minus is the weakest base of these three, because HF, its conjugate acid, is the strongest conjugate acid. So because NH2- minus is the strongest base of these three, that means it's also going to be the strongest nucleophile, whereas F- minus is the weakest nucleophile in these three compounds. I do want to bring up that while basicity and nucleophilicity are related, they are not equivalent. So while a lot of strong bases are also strong nucleophiles, there are compounds that fit into one category but not another. So we'll be taking a look at a lot of non-nucleophilic bases later in the course, and that's something to keep in mind. The final property I want to make you aware of is polarizability. So compounds that are more polarizable are stronger nucleophiles. So if you remember from general chemistry, larger atoms, so as you move down the periodic table in a group, are more polarizable than smaller atoms because they have larger electron clouds, and those electron clouds can be morphed or polarized much more easily. And this is a property that's most important for neutral nucleophiles. For example, we could have PH3, phosphine, and NH3, ammonia, and because phosphorus is one period down on the periodic table directly below nitrogen, it will be the stronger nucleophile because phosphorus has a larger electron cloud that will be more polarizable. And that makes for a more stable transition state and a faster reaction. Same with these compounds, H2SE, so with selenium, H2S, and H2O. So again, Selenium is the largest atom in this group, which means it has the most polarizable electron cloud, whereas oxygen is the smallest and the least polarizable. So that means H2O will be the weakest nucleophile, and H2SE is the strongest nucleophile of these three. One last thing I'd like to talk about is the choice of solvent for SN2 reactions. So of course, in most reactions that we perform in the laboratory, we need some sort of solvent to carry out our reaction in. It turns out that SN2 reactions are much faster in polar aprotic solvents. So aprotic meaning without any sufficiently acidic protons. So a few examples of polar aprotic solvents would be acetone, acetonitrile, NN dimethylformamide, which is pretty common, it's also known as DMF, 
and dimethyl sulfoxide, or DMSO, is also very common. And none of these solvents have any significantly acidic protons, which is very beneficial for our SN2 mechanism. And that's because polar aprotic solvents do not react with the nucleophile or hinder their nucleophilicity. So because the solvents are polar, they are easily able to solvate and stabilize partial charges or dipoles. So dipoles or charges maybe in our nucleophile or in the transition state. However, because the solvents are aprotic, like I said, that means that they will not hinder the nucleophilicity of our nucleophiles. A protic solvent would form sort of a cage around our nucleophiles and prevent them from making their way to the electrophile, to the substrate. So that's why we use aprotic solvents in SN2 reactions. So I hope this video helped you learn more about leaving groups and nucleophiles in SN2 reactions and comparing the strengths of both. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and like and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. And also, please consider donating to my Patreon page, which I will link in the description. It helps me continue to create content like this for all of you. Thanks for watching.